So if they're playing Fortnite with other people online, there's a lot of risk to cyberbullying and things like that. So you can start having chats to them about, you know, what's, what's positive behavior and what's, what is crossing a line with how you treat people and how people treat you and what should you do if you see someone else being bullied online and you can open up those kind of discussions. So you can really sort of help them to navigate their way through the gaming world. And then through that, you can find um, their other passions. So while you're gaming with them, you can start talking about, you know, you used to play basketball, you used to do music. Like, why don't you do that anymore? Is there, like, is there something we can do to, um, to get you back into that? And you can start to redirect them away from their gaming habits. So, um, yeah, look, there's a lot of similarities. And I think the main point is that um, what the young person was saying is that, you know, most of them agree that they would, probably say to every young person i'll game less than me um but it's still um it's still something that you should do and their advice to the parents is to come play with us and see what we're doing uh, get, gain a good understanding of it and uh from there you can be more of a team in uh in uh going through the online world Some of the some of the interests that young people might have could surprise you. Like it could be involved in gaming, so they might get interested in maybe programming a game, or they might be getting interested in marketing games or writing the music for games. Like if they already played guitar, it's like, hey, why don't you try and write some songs for games? You could maybe sell them, and that could be a career. Like you can use their passion for gaming um, to redirect them to other things, but it doesn't have to be outside the realm of what they are interested in. You can you can really narrow it down. They might like making YouTube videos and you might not want them to post it on YouTube, but actually doing the review and, and going through the process of making the video and doing all of that is first off getting them away from the game and second off actually making them to use their cognition and, and actually think and plan and, and do things that are pretty productive for them and uh, whether they release it or not is, a, is another, another issue. There's lots of dangers. There's three main main dangers and that's um being exposed to adult content too early so that includes things like gambling and and sexual content and violence and things like that and then there's um cyber bullying which is huge and then there's the um the, the, the expenditure of funds so you can spend a lot of you can get a free game like fortnite and end up spend I, I, I can't remember the statistic, but it's something like $80 a week that an average family is spending on Fortnite. And um, that's obviously a small percentage of people that are spending a large amount of that money. But, um, and this is just on little things like skins and costumes and, and different things like that that actually have no impact on their, the way they play the game. So it doesn't increase their game. It just increases their self-esteem. It's almost like going out to the shops and buying like a brand new Nike t-shirt or something like they get these skins and they feel empowered. And on the flip side of that, if they don't have these skins, then they're opened up to, to being teased. So A, they can be spending a lot of money on these kind of things. And that can, that can have serious impacts and that can lead to things like gambling and stuff like that. So these loot boxes that they're doing, what happens is you never get to pick what you're going to get. So you'll press a button and it will spin up and then you'll get three random choices and they will be your winnings. And if you want a particular item, you've got to keep on doing that. So you can either do that by playing hundreds of hours of game time and then keep on spinning these boxes while you're playing, or you can spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars and buy these spins. And yeah, there's no guarantee of what you're going to win. And it's, it's highly addictive and it's uh, very similar to, to gambling. And uh, the young people feel the pressure um, of having to do this because that's what most people are doing. They're, they're, most of them have it already and they, they join these games and they're called noobs and, you know, they have no idea what's going on. And they see all these amazing costumes, amazing guns, and, you know, they want it. And it's like a, it's a really dangerous trap that they can fall into. And this is where the, the instant gratification comes in, where they want it now. Um, and if you're ga as a parent, if you're gaming with your young person, you can say, look, it's great to have it now, but you didn't really earn it and it's not, you know, it's not really that significant. But imagine if you actually played this and earned that. Imagine how much better you'll be. You'll be like the true Wolverine, you know, if you get that skin. Like you'll be as powerful as that Wolverine. You won't be like a, a Wolverine in a dress-up costume. You've actually earned that. So they can get 
a bit more reward for for effort rather than um, just this instant gratification thing that happens. And that's, you know, about talking to them. And I think it's really important that parents understand that we seek instant gratification from our demands regularly. And um, so it, it, it's very common. So, you know, I, I have my son that we play in a game and I'll ask him to get off in uh, the next five minutes. Like I always give him a countdown. And then when I go through there 10 minutes later and he's still on, I say, right, get off now. And I expect him to be off. And when he's not, I'm very disappointed and I feel frustration. And this is the same way that they're feeling um, online as well. It's uh, So the, there is that level where we can connect with them just from, okay, both of us want this to happen right now. It's not going to. So let's figure out how we can both get there. And uh, you can start to connect by ways of through that. The world of cyberbullying to me is um, one of the most unspoken about areas, especially in gaming, because there's other aspects that um, I haven't seen many studies on and I haven't um, never considered prior to speaking with a whole bunch of young people. And that's things like, so when, um, say you're playing Fortnite, if someone shoots you and you drop dead, they can do a victory dance. And um, my son, I was talking to him about, you know, do you, ever, do you ever feel bullied or upset while you're playing? And he was explaining that, you know, after he got shot, if someone will do a victory dance, he'll feel like they're teasing him and it makes him feel not good and that he wants to turn off. And, you know, so even the body language of characters within a game can make a, a huge impact on the young person's self-esteem. So my son's turned off the game and not wants to play because of this before. And, you know, it, it's something that's uh, very surprising that, you know, you don't consider. And then on the other side of it, in the gaming world, it's almost, um, it's almost expected that people are going to speak in, a, in ways you wouldn't speak in the real world. So when you're joining a game and you're brand new, it, it, people will call you a noob and they'll be like, what are you doing, man? You suck. And like, they'll say all this stuff that they probably wouldn't say to you in real life. But the feeling that it gives to children, it's actually, there's studies to show that it's actually more impactful on them when that happens online from a stranger. So being in an anonymous situation and getting teased from a, a person that they don't know makes them feel really unsafe. So it's, um, it's really significant. And, that, you know, there's ways around it, like teaching your kids to be by, uh, upstanders, not bystanders. And, and, you know, if people are doing something that could be upsetting, just saying, hey, man, I think that's like wrong. And if the whole group of people do that, that tends to be really effective. But that's something that um, families and children really have to, to learn about and understand that it's, it's not about being a bully to the bully. It's just about saying to the bully, look, this isn't all right. And are you OK? Like often the bully is frustrated themselves. So it's uh, when, when it comes to keeping them safe, it's so vast and um, it's like a huge ocean. So really you've got to get on that, that, that surfboard with your child and teach them how to surf and, uh, and go through it together. Um, that's, that's the best piece of advice I can give. The first thing that we have to acknowledge really is that we don't have enough research and, um, uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't take much to sort of do a scan of the current research to see that there's big chunks of information that are missing. And um, we certainly don't have uh, a good representation of young people's voices within the literature and the research as well. You know, I think that's something that we need to, to work on uh, in greater measure. We need more qualitative studies that are uh, examining, you know, um, the actual experiences as, as Cameron's been mentioning in, in your video. Uh, of young people. Um, but uh, on a whole, you know, the, the uh, literature, uh, you know, is acknowledging that there are increasing issues, I suppose. And, um, you know, we're living in a, a generation now that, uh, you know, has um, had gaming as a, a normal part of their overall um, cultural experience, their social experience, their psychological experience. And so, um, you know, and that's, uh, that's a big shift if you consider just even, you know, 20, 25 years ago, uh, for a lot of parents, you know, there was virtually no internet access, um, you know, gaming was fairly uh, simple and, um, you know, not a lot of, uh, in, in comparison to these days, a lot of Australian homes were, were involved um, 
at any rate level. Uh, and so, you know, this is something that's becoming more and more um, pervasive. I think it's, um, you know, the e-commissioner is saying that it's about four in every five uh, families that, uh, or young people in Australia that game at the moment, that's commensurate with the, you know, the UK and America and other westernised uh, countries. Um, it, you know, there's some of the literature seems to suggest that uh, boys do it a little bit more than girls, although that seems to be a gap that's uh, closing. Um, and um, we're certainly seeing more uh, young women present uh, in the gaming world than, than uh, we have been uh, in the past. Um, some of the other key features in the literature, you know, particularly if we're going to talk about having issues related to gaming, um, you know, is that it's often young people who have a predisposition or a propensity towards other sort of mental health issues that might be more at risk uh, in terms of developing gaming related issues um, in, in their everyday life. Um, so um, a lot of the literature talks about young people that might, you know, be suffering from depression or from anxiety or from ADHD, uh, ADHD or other um, you know, um, young persons related um, disorders that, that might be more at risk of, um, you know, developing difficulties um, with their gaming. Um, estimates vary, uh, you know, they vary greatly uh, in the literature. Um, I mean, I think most of the sort of Australian literature is sort of pointing to somewhere around about 15% of, of individuals developing major uh, issues related with their uh, online world. Um, but again, you know, there's other studies that have showed that um, that's less than 5% or sitting somewhere in the middle, somewhere around about 9% as well. So, um, I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is it's a normal part of, of most young um, people's lives. And, um, you know, we know that the majority of, of, of young people are spending somewhere around about, you know, um, 18 hours or so per week um, doing some form of gaming um, and you know that um, that's a, a very normal part of their socialization and their connection with other young people uh, and with their entertainment and their leisure activities um, and so um, you know other things that the literature are talking about uh, are, are things like um, you know um, image control and um, you know having a particular image online that that's important to you and maybe that's not necessarily reflective of the normal persona that you have uh, in your normal life so it's it's, it's a way in which you can um, act out and, and um, behave in ways and act in uh, ways that normally wouldn't be a part of your everyday life um, there's also um, you know Lots of young people who uh, will, um, you know, be perhaps a little bit more physically or socially isolated, uh, and so uh, you know the gaming world becomes a, a very, very important part of of um, their normal socialisation um, and existence um, in in um, connecting with others. So. Um, We've got even le less uh, uh, literature for you know for us um, professionals that work with this you know in terms of what 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 works well and what what doesn't work uh, well. Although you know there's an increasing sort of amount of literature that talks about cognitive behavioural uh, approaches, um, motivational interviewing, and those types of um, approaches. But again, we you know we just have a big lack of what we call randomised controlled trials that um, allow us to, to measure the efficacy uh, of those approaches. So, um, you know, we really need to do a lot more, a lot more work to understand this a bit better. Well, there certainly is a growing evidence base uh, in, in terms of um, viewing, I suppose, gaming issues as a form of addiction um, in, in, and having some comparison um, in relation to uh, alcohol and other drug addiction, or as Cameron talked about, uh, potentially gambling addiction, or in fact, other forms of addiction that we might have from internet-based um, applications. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, 
but some of the similarities that we that we see, um, which have been done through um, studies that have looked at things like uh, uh, functional MRI or spectrometry, which looks at um, the release of particular uh, chemicals or neurotransmitters in the brain, um, such as dopamine, um, which is a, a neurotransmitter that's you know associated with our uh, pleasure and um, with our uh, entertainment and um, sort of self-soothing um, um, propensities, I suppose, um, you know, showing that there's very similar um, releases of, the, of those types of, of chemicals in the brain um, and affecting the same sort of areas of the brain that other forms of addiction, such as, you know, alcohol and other drugs and gambling um, will also elicit. Um, and, um, and, and so we know that um, out of those studies, for example, that um, we, we might uh, see the development of things like tolerance in, in young people where, um, you know, there's increasing amounts of time that they need to spend uh, online um, or in a game situation to get the same levels of pleasure um, or, the, or the same levels of sort of experience as, as they would get. Uh, the more they play it, um, because you know the 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 release of the the, the dopamine becomes very sensitised, and um, you know um, it takes increasing amounts of that dopamine to to have the same sort of uh, response. So um, you know those neurological um, issues are, are, are certainly a, a growing area where um, you know there's some thought that. Um, gaming and um, alcohol and other drugs and gambling sort of align with each other. Um, we certainly see similar symptoms, I suppose, in, in young people that might have uh, problems with gaming. So, you know, they become very, um, uh, the same symptoms that you might see in someone that's got an alcohol and other drug issue, you know, it might be preoccupation with that, you know, spending a lot of time, um, you know, um, with their life revolving around uh, the idea of gaming. Um, if, if they're not on there, they might get withdrawal symptoms related to that. So they're sort of, you know, having periods where they're, they're, they're uh, you know, feeling very uh, challenged in, in not being able to get online or get access to what they need to get access to. Um, and, you know, as um, the father was talking about in the video, you know, we often see lots of difficulties with sort of managing mood and, um, you know, people, young people getting very anxious or getting aggressive or upset when they're not uh, able to um, access um, online gaming. The differences, of course, are that we don't have any physical substance, I suppose, in, in terms of like we do with, that, with the AOD um, <clears throat> issue. Uh, and, um, you know, as, as we said before, gaming is, is, you know, very culturally and socially embedded in the lives of young people. And so, you know, therefore, it's a very uh, normal thing to do. Um, and uh, the majority of young people will do it well, and they'll, you know, self-regulate and, and have no uh, major issues with it. Um, but, you know, for this, this small um, subset, I suppose, that, that, that do um, start to develop issues. And, you know, there's, there's not the same sort of social and cultural barriers that are out there for other things like illicit drugs, for example. So, you know, there's nothing to stop you from going to EB games or, or buying a particular game or, you know, getting online uh, in free Wi-Fi spaces or et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's all very um, accessible and um, very easy for young people to um, to get at. Um, and so, you know, um, I suppose we, we don't pathologize the idea of gaming as much as we might the idea of um, young people using alcohol and other drugs or, or gambling. Well, I think Cameron summed that up really nicely. You know, I think it's about being present with your child. I think it's about understanding their reality. You know, uh, a great hero of mine, a woman called Hildegard Peplau in the 1950s, she said, all behavior is meaningful and can be understood. So that's really what we need to do. We need to, to come from this position where we can dynamically understand what 
young people are experiencing, what's important for them, you know, what their online world looks like and how they're using it. Um, and, you know, just, just making sure that uh, we're being as empathic as possible and as understanding as possible. Um, I know from lots of experience in working with young people with gaming issues that when families, uh, you know, become very frustrated and upset and they go to extreme measures, you know, I've had families, um, you know, drive their cars over modems and uh, um, take doors off hinges and, um, you know, um, all, you know, all sorts of bizarre measures that families have gone to in frustration or, or in upset over, over the amount of gaming that's uh, occurring. You know, these are all things that I think are, are, are not particularly helpful. They're, you know, why they're expressing the frustration and the, and, the, and the, you know, the upset of the parent at that point in time. They're not really reiterating to the, to the young person that we're interested in their world and that we're trying to understand and help them as best as we possibly can with what is essentially a normal part of their world. You know, it's a, a part of their social, their, their social cultural uh, presence. Um, and so, you know, we really need to adopt this, this approach where we, we try and understand the behaviour as, as best as possible and then, um, you know, work towards um, whatever comes out of that, you know. Over pathologizing the issue, in my mind, as you know, as a child and adolescent psych, is never a good thing. You know, we, we should be very careful about what labels we give young people and how we make them feel about the activities and the actions and behaviours that they have in their in their life. So, you know, um, being as dynamic and understanding as possible is really important. It's really important to remember that. Gaming is a safe place for young people, All right? So if, if, if you picture um, like a young person's life, um, geez, I wish I had a diagram for this, but around them is like their family, their school, their, their sporting interest or extracurricular activities, their friends. And then in today's day and age, gaming is a part of that circle, right? And if you want to connect with your young person, that circle of connection needs to stay complete, right? So if they're not being acknowledged for one of those things, then they feel like they're not necessarily being ag acknowledged as a human being. So while their gaming may be showing some potential issues, it's still a huge part of them. And it's not something that um, I would advise disregarding or trying to take away from them. It's about helping them to be the best version of themselves and that includes in every aspect of their of their life um we should always treat you know seek to try and understand the life of the young person and understand what's going on for them and um look at that as best as we possibly can and um as long as we're communicating well and we are you know um showing an interest in the life uh, of the child and um trying to um, understand their sub subjective experience. Sometimes we have to put the lens of, of the child on. Um, that's part of being a parent, it's part of working with young people. Um, then, you know, if we're doing that, we're, on, we're going to be on the right path.